What's up, Coordination? On the pod today, we have Matthew Stevenson, who is head of cryptoeconomics at Pantera, and Kevin Olson, who is engineering lead at Gitcoin. So basically, why I wanted to have them on the podcast is that we're talking about behavioral game theory today and its applications in the Regen Web3 ecosystem and public goods funding and how we can shift the crypto economics of Web3 to more regenerative systems. So behavioral game theory is a way of modeling the irrationality of the actors of uh, people in a crypto economic system. And SCAM stands for Subgame Credible Anti-MEV. So basically a game theoretic way of solving for MEV. On the podcast today, we talk a little bit about applying behavioral game theory and SCAM to solving some of the biggest civil resistance problems, inclusion resistance problems that Gitcoin and quadratic funding have. So I think a really fun episode because it dives into public goods funding, behavioral game theory, and crypto economics in a big way. So I think you're going to enjoy this episode. Athena Dow is addressing the underfunded areas of women's health, such as menopause and endometriosis. Athena is a community-driven Dow, giving women a say in decision-making and funding the scientific breakthroughs that impact their lives. With cutting-edge technology like Molecule's IP NFT framework, they invest in research IP that ensures exclusive licensing rights. Athena Dow is raising awareness to women's health research, working alongside existing organizations. So join Athena Dow today to help change the landscape of women's health research. What's up, Kevin? What's up, Matthew? What's going on, man? How you doing, Kevin? Pretty good. Excited to talk about a uh, scam. But before we get into that, Matt, what is behavioral game theory and how does it help us think about public goods? Yeah, awesome. So but behavioral game theory is basically a kind of modern extension of game theory that lets it be a little more respective of real human behavior. Um, it's incorporated into mainstream economics now, but it's not really fully into crypto economics formally, even though we use it all the time. So a classic example that we use in in the sort of behavioral uh, game theory world is, say, charitable giving, which relevant to Gitcoin, obviously, right? You, you, when you're donating to the match game pool, part of that behavior is charitable. Why do you do it? Well, there's maybe a warm glow effect, right? You may enjoy seeing these projects get built. You may enjoy the feeling of giving to them. You know, maybe there's a sort of status and reputation effect uh, where I care what other people think of me. And it's nice to sort of be associated with this cool project and get my name on the letterhead. All those things are fundamentally behavioral game theory in the sense that they're like, me caring about these non-material payoffs, right, around, uh, you know, benefiting others or, or things like that, which, you know, is not to say that we don't think material payoffs matter. We certainly do. So, you know, there may be totally self-interested reasons to give to the matching pool. I think in a lot of cases, there probably are for for marketing reasons, but it's kind of about, about saying both. And uh, ultimately, you just see this stuff all over crypto, right? Like we talk about noise trading when we're modeling uh, DeFi with that's irrational behavior. We talk about Social identity with DAOs, I mean, NFT behavior, obviously. And then, you know, Vitalik's excellent post about social legitimacy, sort of like uh, underlying a lot of the security models and things that we do. So I think I think behavioral game theory is kind of everywhere, but uh, it's nice to get a little more formal about it. So I'm really excited to talk. What I'm hearing, at least the way it, this might be too reductionist, but the way it kind of places in my brain is like game theory is what would perfectly rational agents do in a very contained system. But behavioral game theory sort of recognizes the diverse tapestry of uh, things that shape our behavior, social pre preferences, social utility, psychological factors. Like behavioral game theory feels like it's more applied, but also just recognizes the complexity of how people are kind of predictably irrational. Is that too reductionist or is there anything you'd, you'd alter about that? I think that's great. I think that's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of funny how the, the ecosystem has evolved. I feel like in 2017, when I got into the ecosystem, everyone was writing these ICOs and these white papers. And the the kind of thought was like, oh, if you take a human and you put in a token, you will get out an action. Uh, and it turns out that all these projects raised billions of dollars of capital. And most of them never got past the white paper stage of, of deploying things. And, you know, there was a lot of things wrong with the ICO bubble, but taking into account uh, that humans are just more complex than just like, ooh, I get token, I produce behavior, uh, I think was a big thing for me. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, again, so I, uh, we talk more about the like preference side of things, like social preferences. Another part of behavioral game theory is, you know, cognitive limitation, beliefs, things like that. Right. So that's the kind of the other side of it, which I think is certainly relevant to the ICO bubble from what I saw, um, where it seemed like in some cases, people would just see these complex looking white papers and go, I don't understand it. And some people think it's cool. Therefore, I'm going to ape. Uh, and so, you know, cognitive limitations and things like that uh, can, can apply in <laughs> game theory as well. 
Well, uh, I'd love to get into SCAM and what is it? How does it help us fund public goods? How does it help us coordinate? So let, let's get into it. What is SCAM? Yeah, yeah. So so SCAM is a sort of applied uh, behavioral game theory mechanism that uh, I was calling, uh, you know, subgame credible anti-MEV because it came up. I was, you know, uh, I work at Pantera and Flashbots is a, is a portfolio company. I was talking to them. And they were like, you should do a weird behavioral game theory approach to MEV. So it sort of emerged out of that. But um, but it's it's broader than that, and I mean I think through conversations with with Kevin and yourself too, the idea that it can be applied to anti civil. The essential idea with scam is that whenever you're going to have somebody make a decision, and that decision has externalities like this ability to harm others, what you can do is you can have them put up some sort of a stake, and then you can allow the others, including you know maybe mostly the people who are possibly harmed, to retroactively burn that stake at cost to themselves, right? So originally it was subgame credible anti MEV, but we might just call it subgame credible altruism because that gets us the M. Uh, because what that is is it's altruistic sanctioning when you when you burn that money. So I can actually give us a little game example if you want. So like imagine Olson, you you give me ten bucks and you tell me, hey, split this ten bucks somehow between uh, between you and you and Iwaki, right? And uh, and here's the game. So I have this ten bucks and Iwaki, I'm just going to split it. And then however I split it, you get to say yes, and then the split goes through, or else you get to say no, and the money gets burnt. We both get nothing, right? Okay, so I have 10, I have 10, 10 die, let's say, right? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take nine, I'm going to give you one. Yes or no? No, I only get one, you jerk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so that's really common, right? I think any offer less than three gets burned. Like, <laughs> no one gets anything. But now, now look at that in a traditional game theory model. You just chose zero dollars over one dollar. We assume people don't do that. But what did you also do? You also took a dollar and set it on fire so you could burn my nine dollars. It feels like a game of chicken between us there. It's like, well, I'll burn this whole place down if you don't give me the my mutualistic five. Exactly. But it's credible because for you, uh, it's not a theme of chicken where you have to lie and say, oh, I'm going to da da da. It's credible because you feel the emotion of screw you. I'm not taking a dollar for your while you get nine, jerk. Like that is utility maximizing. So that's the uh, sub game portable part. So it feels like to me, like traditional game theory would be like, oh, Kevin will choose to get $1 instead of $0. Uh, whereas behavioral game theory has that emotive sort of like fiery, I'm going to burn this fucking place down kind of set unless I get five thing. And behavioral game theory would predict that uh, that I'll shoot for five over five, whereas regular game theory would maybe say, oh, I'll settle for the one because it's better than zero. Yep. Yep. Tr- traditional game theory will settle for epsilon, for basically the tiniest fraction I could possibly give you. You'll always say, yeah. These sort of mechanisms, uh, which I just sort of, we illustrated one with that game, have been studied and replicated widely across the world. And they're, they vary according to culture, but they're, but the fact that people are willing to punish injustice really does not seem to vary as far as we can tell. Some sort of unfair offer gets punished no matter where you conduct these sort of games. So to, to translate what that game we just played back into the scam, um, we could say that like what I just did was I put up nine dollars at stake, right? And you got to use a dollar to burn that nine dollars to punish me for my unfair behavior. So that's that's fairly generally applicable. And and I mentioned it came up initially in the in the context of MEV, because if somebody got MEV, you have a white hat hacker, let's say, who figured out a way to sort of unlock a hundred k that was stuck in a in a smart contract, and then somebody before that transaction gets. Uh, it's you know it's in the mempool. Somebody simulates it and figures out that before it can go, that's worth a hundred thousand dollars. Front run that, and I'm going to take the hundred thousand for myself and screw the white hat hacker and the person whose funds they were trying to unlock completely. Right. So that's a frustrating thing. And if you instead made the builder, the the MEV or in this case whoever it is, put up a stake, then you could use that sense of unfairness to um, to sanction the person who's doing the wrong thing. Right. And so the point here is not that we do a lot of sanctioning point is that everybody knows that sanctioning is available so they behave more fairly right so if we really played that game i would have probably just offered you five or four maybe right uh i think the optimist offered you four because people usually say yes to that uh just because i know that you'd burn anything less so in the uh, when you apply this scam you don't see a lot of punishment you just see a lot of good behavior so um it feels like it's a way of constructing a g- behavioral game theory a uh, mechanism to stop MEV. And could you take us through the definition like word by word? So it's scam, which by the way, re- I respect the mean game, the mean game calling it scam. Uh, sub sub game, credible, anti-MEV. So is the sub game basically the fact that 
what is the sub game in this? So, so when you when you break out these games and you, and you model it in game theory, you'll you'll often have complex decisions over time. And one way you you solve this is you solve it in the sub game, which is you take let's say some smaller portion of the larger game, and in this case, we'll do it as the the final portion, right, where it ends, and you can predict behavior really cleanly in the last period of that game, right? Because then it reduces to this kind of like one shot game, which we know how to model pretty well. From there, you go backwards, be a backward induction when you solve the game that way. So sub game credibility often determines the equilibrium of these games. I know this is some super jargony, academic nerdy stuff, but the, the essential idea is that w- when you said this is like a game of chicken and I said that yes, and it, but it's a sub game credible commitment. What I mean is that even if we never interact again, you'll still burn that dollar for $9. Even if it's in some sense the end of the game, the sub game, you still find a utility maximizing to burn the dollar for the nine. And that's what's essential about it. Because if, you, if you're relying on these repeated game assumptions and all these other things, those are familiar mechanisms that we use all the time, right? Around like reputation or, you know, uh, et cetera. And, and that's what's kind of different about this one. Is it's okay. It almost feels like the divide and conquer strategy to me. So if MEV is this complex social system, and uh, if I can d- divide it and conquer it into a sub game that's solvable, then that gives me a foothold into solving MEV bubbling up from there. I think that's right. And, and, and it plays nicely with all the solutions people are proposing uh, around MEV, which I think is one of the good things about it, right? Like wherever you find a gap that you can't quite fill with a, with a, with a different mechanism, you can apply this game to sort of say, okay, well, we can't quite figure out censorship in the case of trusted hardware. But you could use the scam on, let's say, censorship, right? And even if trusted hardware is getting you the rest of the way, this can kind of fill in the gaps in a way that's helpful. And so I'd be curious, I want to I, I want to pull in Olson in a sec, and we can start talking about how this could be applied to public goods funding. Uh, but I am wondering, before we before we pivot into that, have you seen scam being used in the anti-MEV ecosystem yet? Or is it is it purely in the theoretical state? I mean, it, there's talk of implementations and, and applications of it, but it was, ju- it was just proposed about a month ago. So it's still pretty early to uh, actively be done. But I think there's interest there from a couple of people who are, who are actively working. At this point, I'd love to pivot the conversation over to you, Olson. I think that you and I were sitting in the audience as Matt was presenting SCAM to, to us. And I think that I was just reveling in the mimetic value of it being called SCAM. And you had some deeper thoughts about how it could be used to solve public goods and, and civil. So... Uh, can you tell us that Olson? For sure, man. Yeah, it was uh, it was a great talk. I don't know if it's going to come out online at some point, but you should link that out to folks because it was it, it just goes that extra kind of level of depth, and it's it's great to see. Um, um, and so like I was listening to that, and I just felt like I'd like you know kind of struck by lightning, right? Like like this this is like an answer to one of our biggest problems, right? Uh, so okay, so I work at Gitcoin, uh, as everyone here knows, but like one of our biggest problems, right, is uh, we, we talk about civil, civil attacks, right? People, you know, standing up stock puppet accounts and distorting uh, the quadratic funding mechanism. But one of the, the issues there is that like um, civil attacks don't happen in a vacuum, right? The, usually someone has control of a grant and they're using this kind of bot farm or bot, bot army of civil t- accounts to, you know, like donate to their own grant and they're, they're you know, using their own funds and they're cycling them back out. We, we can watch this stuff. We always have to catch it in this sort of retroactive sense. It's very difficult to gate proactively you know we will passport and you know, we try to like prove humanity and that's great up to a point but you don't get the whole picture right and that's kind of a, a an infinite game right we, we've talked about this that like you're, you're going to always be chasing your tail uh trying to prove an individual's humanity but when you observe these systems retroactively there's this moment where you really want to like you know you find bad actors and sanction them so it's not it's even like the sanctioning term which we i've used internally a few times I was hearing kind of jump out in, in mass presentation. It's like, this is exactly what we're looking for. Glue that onto this other thing we've been talking about Gitcoin a lot is like, you know, how do we get people to start staking on either their identities or maybe their, their grantees need to stake? But there's always been this like, well, what, what's the slashing mechanism, right? And the problem there is the slashing mechanisms are always these like kind of clunky court appeal like thing that I'm just like, who's going to do that work, right? Like this just does not feel scalable. Like you're just kind of pushing this into this like social reputational space that's just going to be fraught right and and we've even seen this right like when gitcoin in the past is like you know sanctioned a civil ring it plays out in the forums and it's awful right no one feels good about it but what's really elegant about this is like now it's this mechanism where if, if a grantee is staking right and you know malfeasance is discovered right if someone's observing the donation patterns and says this looks like a scam 
you basically broadcast the network and there's this mechanism where anybody can burn some of their capital to then either prevent that person from receiving matching funds at the simplest level. And then you could also burn funds to like slash their stake. So you, you have kind of like two ways. You could first, you could kind of ostracize them, right? And exclude them from the rewards, which they've you know earned through their malicious behavior. Uh, so they just don't get any matching. Or you could literally like actually slash stake and really, really like hurt them, right? Like really punish them. And um, one of the things that's been sort of stuck in my mind was, um, you know, Ostrom's uh, polycentric governance paper. One of the big things that jumped out at me is like one of the things you need to have is the ability for these different groups to sanction each other. You have to have this ability for the different groups, these different polycentric groups, to be able to exclude each other and actually have some way to manage this common pool resource. And that's always been missing for me when people talk about these games is that sanctioning element. Um, so what I loved about this, it puts the power of sanctioning back into the community. The job to be done is really just to broadcast, hey, we think we found a scam. And at some sort of mechanism level, there's this ability for people to burn their own money in this, like, this like, very psychologically powerful thing. Like I burned my own capital to, to punish somebody. Um, it, it also has this elegance of like, there's probably not a great way to like turn this into an economic game of self, like a self-interested economic game. Um, so all of that like came together for me, started like, went, right outside and i think i talked to matt cornered him for a while i was like how do i make this work uh we've been working together on a on a, a paper like a like a gov post we'll get the uh, Bitcoin forums here pretty soon um where we try to like spell this out how this could work but um but for me this is like super elegant solution to you know one of our biggest problems which is like really just securing the allocation of capital in the gitcoin network so this for me feels like like a like a like a total like first thing to try um, I'm just super psyched about it. Yeah. So let me, let me play that back for the audience just to, um, bring them up to a level of common understanding. So, uh, Gitcoin, uh, which you're the VP engineering of, um, is a quadratic funding application or well, primarily quadratic funding. Gitcoin grants can do other things, but, um, quadratic funding has this amazing property where it, you take a matching pool and you allocate it to, uh, the results of a crowdfunding campaign but you allocate based off of the number of contributors instead of the amount that they funded. So Olson, if you have a grant that has $100 from 100 contributors and I have a grant that has $100 from one contributor, you get 99% of the matching pool, which has this amazing democratic effect of how capital is allocated in that uh, it gets allocated to the preferences of the poor and the many over the rich and the few. Um, and also contributors to your grant can contribute a dollar and they get tens or hundreds of dollars in matching, which are two really amazing attributes. But it also introduces this Achilles heel of if I can spin up a bunch of fake accounts, then I can drain the matching pool and send it to my grant. So that's the civil resistance problem. And basically, uh, there's a bunch of gating mechanisms on Gitcoin Passport that help identify civil attackers and, and like gate the round. There's also a $1 minimum, which means that if you're going to attack the round, you need to spend at least a, a dollar. And then there's also retroactive data science where um, where civilers can be sanctioned. And the problem with the sanctioning is that it becomes this whole uh, really clunky system where people don't feel really good uh, after the sanctioning has happened. It plays out in the governance forum. It gets into a debate on Twitter. And so is there a more elegant way to sanction the civil attackers or the collusion attackers in the system? And, and that's what you're sort of evaluating scam for. Did I play that all back in a way that, that comports with you, Olson? Totally, totally. And it actually decentralizes the kind of like this step of our, our governance, right? Like it, it pushes like the decision making that, that sanctioning isn't happening from Gitcoin anymore. And it can actually happen from any actor in the system uh, or any other grantee. And it, I, I really like that dynamic, right? It actually like removes us as this like you know, central authority uh, governing it and really kind of pushes it where it could actually be, you know, in the uh, mechanism or the protocol itself. Uh, I'll just add, uh, you know, on the on the meme front, since you mentioned scam as a meme, one of the things in, in my talks that's trying to meme this is as kind of a retro public harm or or retro public bad. I think is is what uh, Olson suggested, right? And that's sort of the commonality I think that helps uh, bridge between MIV, MEV and, and anti civil, which, as you noted, is just something where it's just, it's a little easier to figure out these things a lot of times after they've happened, right? And it's very hard to design mechanisms around that. So, you know, the scam is ex post slashing because it's anti slashing is kind of easy. If we can tell you exactly what is the wrong thing to do, meaning like just before the fact, we can easily just slash you for it. We could write that into the protocol. But for anti civil stuff, it's a creative act, same with MEV. So it's very hard to pre specify. Um, 
but yeah, it's a it's a mechanism for for punishing retro public bads, right? For reducing retro public bads. Certainly, civil attacks are are a great example of that. And I do think you know as, as we've talked it through, uh, Olson, and and hopefully you know Iwaki, you agree, like that does arouse emotional feelings of unfairness sufficient that like when somebody feels like the matching pool got partially drained um when somebody feels like oh gosh i'm mad at that person for civil attacking a public good that's all you need for the scam to fundamentally be effective and it feels to me like that's there all the ingredients are there right it's just time to put them together yeah one of my sort of principles for crypto economic systems that's heavily informed by listening to vitalik talk about proof of stake is that you need to create an equilibria where it's cheaper to defend a system than it is to attack the system. Um, and so like proof of stake is really elegant with this because I have to stake 32 ETH, which right now is like $64,000 in order to create a validator node. And I get incremental rewards for securing the network. And if I attack the network, my stake gets slashed by 16 ETH, which is like $30,000, like can happen within 15 seconds. And so proof of stake is this really interesting economic equilibrium where it's just way cheaper to defend than attack and because of that shelling point that's what secures all of our bags on this distributed network and I, i've sort of just been using that as a as like a light in the darkness because gitcoin grants is this really amazing way of funding public goods with quadratic funding but it just feels like it has this achilles heel where it's cheaper to attack than defend and so building an equilibria or like a crypto economic system uh that 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 makes it cheaper to defend than to attack, I think is how we scale it from, and I'm using we in the royal we here because, because of course I've disaffiliated from Gitcoin and it's now up to the DAO and blah, blah, blah. But um, you know, the royal we, we just need to make quadratic funding way cheaper to defend than to attack. And so, you know, creating uh, on top of this civil inclusion problem, interesting, innovative new mechanisms that can, uh, they can just shift that balance a little bit and if each mechanism can can shift the balance a little bit, the compounding effect can be that making the entire system cheaper to defend than to attack. And so, um, you know, really interested to see how this fits with the gestalt of other civil mechanisms. I know that Gitcoin's working on minimum donations and cluster mapping. We just had Joel Miller on the pod and the $1 minimum and all of that kind of stuff. This feels like another tool in the tool belt that like together they can make it cheaper to defend than, than to attack. I'd say it's super complementary to something like cluster mapping, if I understand that correctly, right? Because that just reduces the cost of no of identifying the, the bad actors. Those things are all essential. Yeah, exactly. I think that that's like a, a really big piece that's missing too is, uh, you know, I mentioned civil attacks in the, in the kind of sense that uh, here, like I have, I have a, a scam grant and I'm building a bunch of accounts and I'm draining the matching pool that way. But then you have these other actors that are sort of distorting quadratic funding uh, as well, right? You have airdrop farmers and you have people who are just maybe farming for like reputation uh, and they're using, you know, our mechanism and they're kind of clouding the results of it. But what's great about cluster mapping is the hope that, you know, you can surface which group memberships they belong to and sort of overall, you know, attenuate the effect that they have, um, which is like one effect, sort of like anti-collusion piece. But then it also has an effect too, is just large homogenous groups you know, you can't just rally a bunch of, you know, lookalikes, you know, who uh, drain a matching pool. And actually it has this very kind of like tie into the DSOC paper, which is really trying to say like, you know, uh, you know, sort of plurality thing of, you know, cooperation across, uh, you know, social d distance. And I, I'm really excited for like what that would do. Like what would that amplify in sort of a, a quadratic funding round if we had something like that? You start seeing where there's common support across multiple uh, communities. And I think that's a very powerful thing to start amplifying. Matt, anything to add there? Just totally agree. I mean, I think that's, <laughs> I, you know, I, we, we have a, the, the host we've been working on writes some, some qualifications into certain ways you might be sort of like tempted to overstep the, the mechanism in certain ways, right? Like one of the things we note is, you know, if you compensate people who are doing this altruistic sanctioning too much, then you can create these kind of feedback effects where there's a symbiotic relationship between the civil attackers and the people punishing them because the punishers make their living off of the civil attackers existing, right? Whereas the nice thing about the, the kind of CM mechanism is you're perfectly thrilled when unfairness stops, right? You, you're not looking to punish people unless they're doing these things. So actually, you know, something we were talking about just before um, Olson is, is one of the findings you get. I mentioned that if you, if you test this mechanism across the world, it works very well and people are willing to, uh, to sanction unfairness if you allow people to sanction back against unfairness, it 
becomes a little messier and a little more culturally, a little more culturally variant, right? So there's just like, you have to exercise caution when you're implementing it in a game that might extend further than a sub game, right? Where you will have reputations at stake and stuff and so on. So I think we're, we're pretty careful to note that, but it's, it's some fun behavioral game theory findings. You can start seeing people getting into like a battle, right? Where they're like, you know, each round, you know, they're sanctioning each other. That, and this is where you, one of the, the things I like about this is playing with these ratios of what, how much capital you have to burn to sanction. And I actually think that this is a great thing to like actually, uh, you know, uh, govern at the protocol level, right? So the, the DAO would vote on, okay, it's a one to 10 ratio to burn to prevent uh, people from receiving matching funds or maybe to one to one uh, to slash them. And you can really sort of flatten like the, and, and make it more democratic what the sort of sanctioning effect is. Or if we're not getting sanctioning and scamming is happening, you could ratchet that up to one to 100 ratio. It's really easy to sanction people uh, rather than having to rally some big group behind, you know, like excluding some bad actor. But, you know, like these are the things you can play with over time and hopefully keep from getting into, you know, these sort of, like you're mentioning this, or like, you know, it's a broad community, right? You could, you could get these pockets that get really, uh, uh, you know, in this tit for tat kind of battle uh, and you'd hate to see that happen, right? So we need to be able to play with these parameters. Totally. Yeah. But it's a, a experimentation will sort of unearth that, those sort of dynamics. And, and hopefully this will be a, a worthwhile thing to experiment with. One thing we'll have to figure out, and this is, by the way, my department is what's the meme? If it's not, if it's not anti MEV anymore, are we talking about SCAS here? Subway incredible, anti Sybil, <laughs> uh, anti collusion. I'm into uh, it. You big brains can talk about the mechanism and I'll just figure out the meme while you do. But Please if do. any audience members have an idea of, of what it's called when it's applied to civil or let me know. We could change it to subgame credible altruism or something instead, just because it's all of them are going to include an altruistic punishment component. But SCAS? Ska, there we go. Take me back to the 90s. <laughs> it has a ring to it. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'd be curious uh, if, if if we've picked all the fruits of, of subgame credible anti-civil and anti-collusion, if we could zoom back out and talk about behavioral game theory in and around public goods and in crypto economics. Um, I, I'm just really excited about the idea that we can fund public goods with crypto and, and you know, our bread and butter from my time at Gitcoin um, was quadratic funding, but there's also conviction voting and retroactive public goods funding and a bunch of different mechanisms and and uh, Matt, I'm wondering if if you see uh, any other sort of fruitful areas to direct the audience's attention to with respect to behavioral game theory and funding public goods, solving the tragedy of the commons, things of, of that nature. Yeah, definitely. I mean, first of all, I, I big fan of the ones you mentioned, right? With with like conviction voting is really cool, and um, I, you know, I'm sure the audience is well aware of the um, the laundry list of cool mechanisms you put together. I think it's super modular, which I think is a fantastic resource. Um, one of the things that uh, I've seen recently that I, I think just got announced maybe last month that I think is really cool on the front on the what you might call kind of a like meta public good, you might consider uh, this punishment thing a little bit of a meta public good in a sense, right? Where you're kind of enforcing the rules of paying for public goods. And you can think of governance that way too, right? Famously, governance itself is a public good, and so if you have to if you have to have governance over a public good, that's kind of meta governance. So there's a there's a company called M Zero. It's, it's, it's like a DeFi project, but they have this really interesting element on their governance where they constantly deflate people who don't vote. And it has this, it has this fun dual effect in behavioral game theory. One of them is, I'm basically saying, I really trust you to vote. I want to ensure you vote, right? So that's implied by the mechanism. It's implicit because like you're actively being harmed if you're not voting. So it communicates this kind of trust and induces participation that way. But the other thing it does that's kind of fun is you know, sometimes people aren't voting because they're worried about regulation because blah, blah, blah. So it starts to also select out the people who are resistant on certain topics and dampens their voice because they're not really kind of putting their money where their mouth is. So that's the most recent example of something that feels like a really clean, elegant mechanism around governance, which is, of course, you know, sort of a nightmare problem to solve. So um, they're, they're calling it uh, the SPOG, <laughs> all about the uh, all about the four letter all caps meme names here. But uh, big shout out to that one. I think that was really cool. Wait, spell that out for me. What does SPOG stand for? Uh, that, oh my gosh, I wish I could remember. Let me see. Let me see if Google helps me. I'm sure it's something. Well, you know, and, and just in general, I feel like we could do a whole nother pod about behavioral game theory in, in crypto and in governance and everything like that. I mean, just thinking about the cognitive limit that we discovered. I mean, I just remember early on in the Gitcoin days, 
you know, you're designing this governance model and you, you're, or you're thinking like, in my mind, when we were designing Gitcoin's governance back in the day, it was like, what would a fully informed uh, participant that had read the whole, all the governance forum posts, like vote. And like, the reality is that everyone wants to hold governance tokens and no one wants to spend any mental cycles on anything. And so just like the cognitive limits of, I didn't even really read the thing, but I have to vote on it. Um, and also I'm busy with like, 17 other ta behavior like tabs open like those feel like behavioral game theory and um i think that we can design better governance systems realizing that probably you only have like a tenth of the the governor's brain when they're voting on something uh as opposed to like their full attention um designing for for that kind of world is vastly different than than i think that what we imagined and hoped it would be but working around those constraints or, or recognizing those constraints allows us to work around them. Yeah, 100%. I think that's exactly right. Like limited attention, cognitive uh, cognitive constraints, et cetera, all explain that stuff. And, uh, you know, one of the things I definitely say on the behavioral game theory front is that most people who've been working in this space, like you all have, they know this stuff in their bones, right? You might not be more modeling it formally. Sometimes modeling it formally helps, sometimes not. But most of the problems you're solving are actually probably pretty closer to behavioral game theory than regular traditional mathy i mean it's all it's actually pretty mathy if you do behavioral too but you know the rational actor model we don't always we don't always call it that but i think it's it's always it's always pretty much there right so yeah i mentioned the examples of like noise trading and social identity and stuff but yeah when we talk about DAOs and this was coming up around around like nfts and the way that people who just share a sort of aesthetic preference will act the same way when exposed to certain mechanisms they'll have this kind of like strong in-group bias um it's called a minimal group uh, like like a minimal group bias, so you can just sort people minimally, and they will suddenly act uh, as if this is the in group and this is the out group, and that's a that's a pretty strong behavioral effect that only requires a little nudge to produce in some cases. Obviously, DAO is full of that stuff. Yeah. Also, anything to add here? I was just laughing at the idea of like subgroups within the DAO and <laughs> with the nudges we have to act the same way. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't really have much to add on that. I do I do love that there's finally you know like formal ways to i think you know confirm like you're saying the things that we've observed and things that we like kind of know in our bones so you know definitely love when uh you know uh academia confirms the things that we already think that's a good feeling but also what i really love too is that this is experimental so this is i mean like one of the things you said matt uh i don't remember it came up already at this but this stuff's been widely repeated you don't have the reproducibility problem of other social sciences sciences so this is for me like super exciting because it could be reproduced n times across n labs and you get very consistent results that are predictable and repeatable and that's what gives me a lot of like confidence this isn't just like one group found this one weird effect these are like all, all truths maybe if you will like uh, within the way people play these games yes widely replicated truths and I, I actually wind up using the term behavioral game theory over like behavioral economics just to sort of communicate that even though to an academic audience they would kind of be the same thing um, the fact is that like behavioral game theory kind of began as like the way crypto analysis or crypto analysis is to cryptography, where it was like a way of basically pushing against and breaking these systems. Early behavioral game theory was just, no, you're wrong. And we're going to show it to you via a thousand experiments. And because those, that was such a fraught battle, these things got replicated and replicated and replicated. So actually, um, you know, when we go back to that game, we, we first talked about the, the splitting with $10 you know, a natural reaction that people gave is, ah, that'll go away if it becomes a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars. Turns out it does not, which is kind of astonishing how robust that sense of fairness is. It attenuates a little bit, but it does not go away. I mean, generally speaking, even if it's ten thousand to a hundred thousand of the equivalent, you're still willing to burn it because of the unfairness, which sounds kind of crazy, but but uh that's that's pretty well validated. It does become a weaker effect, but the effect is still there. It doesn't just vanish as you as you make the stakes higher and higher, which is which is I think a really cool thing. Have you guys proven there's no free will yet? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, tough one. <laughs> yeah, have you been hanging around Zuzilur? That that came up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, I guess is there anything I didn't ask that you wanna that you wanna say, Matt? Appreciate the opportunity to to talk about this stuff and cover it and the, and the excellent questions. It's fun to be able to try and apply it in a new domain and everything too with anti so it's, I'm really looking forward to the experiment if it we're able to pull it off. Can't wait to see where it goes. Uh, and I'll keep uh, you know carrying my weight by trying to figure out the meme uh, if it is successful. 
Please do. Yeah, help us out. Olson, is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to say? Uh, no, not so much. Um, I'm really excited to start hearing how the community reacts to this. You know, as people read, uh, you know, the post and hear this, uh, like what the sort of feedback we get is. But um, you know, my my enthusiasm is is still there. But looking forward to seeing where the debate goes uh, as we try to apply this to Bitcoin. Well, thank you both for uh, for joining me. I'll have a link to both of your Twitters in the show notes, and then also, Matt, you have a Twitter thread. Uh, art- articulating what scam is and how it works. So it encourages listeners to check that out. Um, and then if by the time this airs, y'all's uh, gov post about how this applies to quadratic funding is live, I'll also link that in the show notes. Cool. I think we can do that. Alrighty. Thanks for joining me. Peace and love. Cool. Thanks, man. Thanks a lot, Kevin.